Okay. So I think we'll go ahead and get started today. It's uh, Kim couldn't make it. I think he's recovering from his shot. So I'm going to take over the MC duties today. Um, we're really happy to have Alessandro Ruggieri uh, to tell us about trade and labor market institutions, a tale of two liberalizations. Take it away, Alessandro. Thanks a lot, George. So let me thank all the organizers for inviting me. I'm very happy to present this paper. So this is a paper about, as the title says, trade and labor market institution. And it is motivated by the large waves of trade liberalization that we're witnessed in the last 40 years. Many developing countries have liberalized their trade regime, making the share of the world population in open country jumping from 20 to 60% in 2005. But most importantly, it's a paper that is motivated by two facts that have gone hand in hand with trade liberalization. The first fact is an empirical evidence about some, dis some level of disruptions in the labor market following the trade liberalization. In particular, there are many, there is evidence of uh, increasing unemployment following reduction in trade costs, though this evidence seems to be quite heterogeneous across countries. The second fact is that most, the second fact is that there has been a large heterogeneity in labor market institutions in place at the time of the trade liberalization. And when I talk about labor market institutions, I mainly refer to foreign costs or employment protection legislation, minimum wage regulation, and unemployment insurance. So given these two facts, the question I address in this paper is how do labor market institutions affect the response of unemployment to trade liberalization, and in general, the labor market adjustment following a reduction in trade costs. And eventually, what are the implications of introducing labor market regulations on the aggregate gains from trade and the distribution of those gains in the population? How do I address this question? Well, I build a two-sector model of international trade that features a number of elements, and in particular, search frictions in the labor market and a rich set of labor market institutions. I'm going to discipline the model using firm level data for the industrial sector in Mexico and in Colombia. Why these two countries? Well, for three reasons. The first reason is that both of them went through a series of trade liberalization. In particular, the first major liberalization in Mexico was in 1986, the second one in Colombia in 1992. The second reason is that Colombia and Mexico opened up the trade with very different institutional setting, and in particular, Mexico opened up to trade with a very high level of foreign costs and a low level of minimum wage, making the burden of adjustment from trade on employment versus while at the same time, Colombia opened up to trade with the opposite institutional setting, meaning very high minimum wage and very low foreign costs, making the burden of adjustment on, uh, on, uh, on employment rather than wages. And the third reason is that the evolution of many outcomes in the labor market between the two countries were quite different. In particular, Colombia witnessed an increase in unemployment following the trade liberalization, increase in income inequality, and in job turnover in the industrial sector, something that Mexico did not experience, or at least not at the same level as Colombia. Now, Alexander, I'm going to... May, yes, I, yes, may I interrupt you, please? The, of course. Uh, the other key difference was that the Mexican trade liberalization was bilateral or multilateral, right? It joined the WTO and subsequently joined the NAFTA. It was always yeah. uh, there opening up, also opening up to other export opportunities. While in Colombia, it was a unilateral trade liberalization and the exchange rate remained appreciated for a while. It wasn't until several years when it depreciated and exports took off. So that's got to play a role also if you're getting import competition and no, not much export opportunities, right? So why do you have anything to say about that? So the model would be, so the model would be a small open economy model where I will, um, I will calibrate the, the foreign market by trying to match the export share, the average export share of firms. So, so basically, Changes so differences in the type of trade liberalization will show up also in differences in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the shifter of the foreign markets. 
across the two countries. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna speak exactly exactly about this about this issue. Of course, then there will be an empirical evidence before the model uh, where I will show where I will show you a little bit of a little bit of the dynamics of unemployment following trade liberalization. I will use an index of trade liberalization that is quite uniform across different countries. So that to some extent might take care of, of your concern, but I won't really speak about differences in bilateral versus unilateral trade. I will only speak about changes in tariffs and changes in additive costs that could match the increasing revenue share of, uh, of exporters. So okay. to some extent it will be captured by that, to some extent it will be captured by that, but it's not really uh, addressing exactly what, what your, what, what's your concern. So then I, I will use the model uh, to as a laboratory to do two major exercises. The first exercise is to simulate the trade reform that uh, under the observed labor market institutions in both countries, separately in Mexico and Colombia, to see whether the model could replicate the differences in the in the labor market dynamics observed within the two countries, in particular in the dynamics of unemployment, sector unemployment, job for lower income inequality, and then. As a second exercise, I will uh, implement the same type of trade liberalization, but under central partial labor market institutions to account for how much of the dynamics observed in labor markets can be explained by, by, by those institutions. And, uh, and to do so, we saw for the entire, for the entire transition part towards, towards the, new, the new city state. So let me give you uh, a brief description of what are the mechanisms that I try to put forward, put forward with the model. So in the model, uh, greater openness in a country will basically generate two effects. It will create a drop in the domestic revenue because of uh, changes in, in the composition of consumption goods towards imported goods, but it also will generate larger rents from exporting. Particular firms will start either participating in the, expo in the, in the foreign market or they will increase their, their share of, uh, of uh, export revenue, of revenues coming from exporting. And of course, changes in change, this asymmetric change in the marginal revenues will trigger adjustments in employment and wages. Low productivity firms likely will downsize, they will try to renegotiate wages downward, or eventually even exit if they won't be able to cover the cost of operating, whereas high productivity firms will likely start exporting and they will expand post vacancy and look for workers and slowly expand until they reach their optimal loop size. At the same time, there will be changes in wages, and in particular, those changes in marginal revenues increase for exporting firms and decline for uh, domestic non-exporting firms will generate a larger cross-sectional correlation between wages and employment or productivity of the firm. But of course, those changes won't happen immediately. And this is because mar labor markets are frictional. So this will prevent immediate, immediate reallocation of workers from uh, from domestic non-exporting firms or to, to exporting high productivity firms. And also because it's, it's costly to expand and there, there will be adjustment costs that will prevent immediate, the immediate reaching of the new uh, city state firm size for, for those firms. And, uh, and in, in this particular setting, labor market institutions will distort the two margins of adjustment, meaning adjustment in employment distribution and wage distribution in different ways, depending on whether the institution produces a wage rigidity or unemployment rigidity. The minimum wage regulation will introduce a downward wage rigidity, which will create what I call an amplification effect, meaning that larger minimum wage will make employment at a firm level much more volatile, simply because we will force adjustment to, through the employment margin. Firms won't be able to, down, to uh, adjust downward wages when they hit the minimum wage. And, uh, and this, of course, we create much larger dismissal of workers with implications for both unemployment and labor and, uh, and, and, labor and uh, any community one. On the other hand, uh, employment protection legislation will introduce unemployment rigidity and which will create what I call a stabilization effect, meaning that higher firing costs will actually make employment at the firm level less volatile simply by discouraging uh, firms to make labor adjustment and rather uh, making more, uh, increasing the incentive in adjusting wages downward if they can. So let me give you a preview before jumping to uh, the aggregate into the model, some preview of the results. So um, in the simulated economy, labor market institutions 
seems to be determinant of trade adjustment, and in particular, they account for quite a big portion of the cross-country differences in unemployment following the reduction in trade costs, 30% in the short run, 60% in the long run. And in particular, I will show that unemployment will react more strongly following a trade cost. Um, the larger is the minimum wage and the lower is the final cost. And moreover, uh, there will be an efficiency equity trade-off as the economy will move from will move from employment rigidity towards wage rigidity, and this trade-off will be generated by the fact that wage rigidity introduces larger selections in the model. This increases wages overall, but at the same time pushes up probability of being fired, which makes the gains much more dispersed across the entire population. On the other hand, employment rigidity doesn't favor selection that lowers aggregate gains, but at the same time doesn't push up the probability of being dismissed, making the, the gains much more equally distributed across the population. And finally, if I have time, hopefully, I talk about a little bit unemployment insurance. Um, or, and in particular, I will show you that implementing the same exact trade, trade liberalization that we observe with a positive unemployment benefit, a positive, a positive transfer to the unemployed, will actually uh, help reducing the dispersion of gains from trade in the population at the, unfortunately at the cost of a lower aggregate gains from trade, but we will see that there is a trade-off that is introduced by the employment, by, the, by, the, by introducing the unemployment age. So I think by sake of time, I will skip a little, I will skip the literature and I will jump to the aggregate evidence. Um, so, I, to, to, to talk about the dynamics of unemployment and how these dynamics relate to the trade liberalization and the labor, and the labor market institutions in place, I gathered, uh, I assembled a, a data set of, for 40 developing countries, spanning more or less on average 40 years. All of these countries have uh, implemented a, liberal, a trade liberalization, and I'm going to use uh, a measure that comes from tax and barnes is a measure of the euro liberalization date, which is the first year upon which a number of conditions are continuously met, and those conditions have to be with a level of tariffs that is lower than 40% of total value of imports, level of other non, level of non-trade buyers that is lower than 40% of total of total import and other dimensions. But uh, you will see, I mean, there are other, in the papers and also other robustness that have to do with uh, measure of import penetration and tariffs. I am taking an employment rate from uh, ILOSTAT and I'm using institutions, a uh, measure of institutions from uh, the from the federal law for the Benedict, in particular, a measure of credit costs as the sum of, of advance notice and severance and seven payments. Both of them are expressed as a, as a multiple of the monthly wage, of the average monthly wage at the time of the liberalization. The statutory minimum wage is measured as a fraction of the average annual wage, and the unemployment insurance, which is a coverage weighted replacement rate at one year for people who are dismissed and unemployed and unemployed after one year of, of dismissal. So if we look at the unemployment, the average unemployment uh, in the sample of, uh, of countries that I have, over time, before and after the, the liberalization, there seems to be a positive shift following the trade liberalization, which is about three percentage points and seems to be significant. This is, of course, what I'm showing you is just the unconditional, uh, the unconditional unemployment rate on it, the average unconditional unemployment rate in the sample for every period before and after the trade liberalization. But the idea that I want to stress is how much of this increase could be attributed to uh, the labor market institutions that are in place at the time of liberalization. So to speak about this, I am estimating a simple pan, linear panel data model when I, relate, when I relate the unemployment rate of country I S and T to the degree to the dummy for openness and to an interaction between the dummy of openness and the level of labor market institution Z, uh, that are those that I already mentioned, finding cost minimum wage and unemployment insurance, controlling for country year fixed effects and a bunch of other Controls, including also country-specific trends. Uh, from this Alessandra, type of, um, yes. In in your sample, are there countries who um, kind of had conditional liberalizations, um, kind of from the IMF kind of things, where you're in a crisis and and that leads you to then do a liberalization like in India that would be confounding your, you know, finding of unemployment rising. <laughs> 
so that that could be countries. I mean that 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 uh, that that could be countries like the one you're mentioning. Uh, so the the sample of countries that I'm using uh, are I mean are countries that all met the requirements in terms of trade liberalization requirements following I mean fo I mean following those that are proposed by Sachs and Barner that have to do with tariffs that have to do with um, with the non-trade barriers with and uh, and other and other conditions on the exchange rate. On the black market and the exchange rate, no socialist uh, government in place. I have a refinement of this version of this type of regression where I control, where for instance, instead of having an index of openness, I use tariffs. Okay, simple, simple okay. tariffs. Or I interact the level of openness with, uh, with, um, with import penetration. And all those refinements seem to give the same, the same type of response. Which is which is the following? On average, condition on the controls and employment seems to increase following trade reform by 1.55 percentage points, but the response of unemployment seems to be larger. The lower is the foreign cost, in particular, if I see in, if a country opens up to trade with a foreign cost that is higher by one monthly wage, the response of unemployment seems to be lower by 0 0.18 percentage points. And, uh, and the response of unemployment seems to be also larger, the, the larger is the minimum wage. In particular, an increase of the minimum wage of 10% leads to uh, an increase of unemployment rate of uh, 0.40%. But most importantly, once we control, once I control for a dispersion, uh, for heterogeneity in labor market institutions at the time of trade reforms, they seem to capture most of the, uh, of the variation in unemployment in the sample. So this means that they play a role, it seems to seems they play a role in explaining what is the dynamics of unemployment following trade liberalization within within the entire within, within the entire sample of countries that we have. Now, so zooming in into the into the into the data set that, uh, that I have, we can look at the experience of two particular countries, in particular Mexico and Colombia. Uh, I already uh, mentioned to you why uh, those, those countries are of interest for this particular analysis. They both liberalized. Of course, they, there are differences in the type of liberalization, but the average applied tariffs on all products dropped for Mexico and Colombia. The two dates we are taking in consideration are 86 and 92, 86 for Mexico, Colombia, and 92. But as you can see, there is a completely different dynamics in the labor market in terms of unemployment rate. There was basically no increase in unemployment, no change in unemployment rates in Mexico. In the 20 years following the liberalization, there was a large increase a few years after the liberalization in Colombia. There was a large increase in informality rates in Colombia, something that Mexico experienced, but with a lower, with a lower magnitude. And there is a much and there was a much larger increase in the in income inequality measured by the Gini coefficient in Colombia. In Mexico, there was a some increase in wage inequality has been documented extensively in the literature. It it's also reflected in some increase in income inequality, but not as big as, as what uh, Colombia witnessed. And uh, I want to relate. Alessandra, yes. um, if you had included Brazil, we have all these experts in the audience, would it have looked more like the Colombia experience then? Um, this is a this is a good question. This is a good question. So I can't really tell you right now whether it would that it would it, it I mean it looks like it, it might look like in terms of experience in the labor market and disruptions in the labor market that Brazil could be could be uh, very similar to the employment rate, but I cannot tell you right now what is the level of minimum wage or whether we can relate differences between Brazil and Mexico, for instance. To the level of institutions that we observe, something that we can do for Colombia. That that was exactly. I mean, this, this allows me to introduce the next slide. I, I'm trying to relate these differences in the dynamics of labor market to the differences in the labor market institutions in place, and we observe differences between Colombia and Mexico. In fact, in Mexico, we observe a firing cost that is only roughly 30%. Um, of the of the annual wage and a minimum wage, and it's also 33% of the annual wage. This is different for for Colombia, where at the time of liberalization, the 
the final cost was 50%, but exactly when the, when, when the trade reform was implemented, also labor market was implemented, making the foreign cost from 50% to 8.3%. This basically is from six monthly wage to one month equivalent wages. And the, at the same time, the minimum wage was that at a very larger level, 50% of the annual wage. Now, of course, in the, this can invalidate the change in, in, the, in the labor market institution exactly happening at the time of trade liberalization can invalidate the empirical analysis, but the, but the quantitative model will allow me to replicate exactly the type of reform implemented and see exactly how much of the change in the filing cost could be, could be drivers of the, of the movement in unemployment rate. As you, would, as you can see, there was no unemployment benefit in place in both countries. So I will speak about this as, a, as, a, as um, I will speak about the role of unemployment benefits jointly implemented in a counterfactual world, jointly implemented with trade reforms. But the main, the bulk of the paper will be about differences between minimum wage and, and final cost. Alessandro? Uh, yeah. So the, the Colombian liberalization was kind of like a phased in reform. Um, I, I don't know about the Mexican liberalization, but um, a, a lot of kind of uh, the kind of speeding up of that reform was in response to the economy going into recession. So I just, I wonder to what extent there's also differences in the timing of the reforms that could, um, you know, could matter. So, you know, there was, it was very clear that there was no point in buying capital goods um, in Colombia when the price of capital goods was going to fall another 10% in the next period. And so um, were those, you know, was, were these exactly the same types of liberalizations? So um, in the empirical evidence that I showed you, that, re, that has to do with all the countries, not only Colombia. I control also for periods of recession and country-specific trends, and I'm trying to control for banking crisis as well. So I try to take, to take care of all these differences in the, in the nature of trade liberalization induced by maybe business cycles or other, or other initial well, no, this, conditions. This, in this, the, is, in, yeah, this is really just trying to say that the nature of the reform actually caused the recession in, in Colombia. Um, were contributed to the, the economic weakness in 1990. Um, and so th that's why I was trying to think about is the shock the same in the two places, if, especially if we're kind of focusing on the impact effects of, of the reforms. I mean, definitely, definitely in the quantitative section, this is true. I mean, and indeed, the model won't be able to capture the increase of 10 percentage points in unemployment rate. The model will account for much less. So I would say that but so, so you're going to try to you're going to try to explain the rise up through 2000, not kind of like what happens from 90 to 93. That's that's your focus. Is the... no, I'm going to I'm going to try to explain exactly. I'm going to try to explain the differences in the between Colombia and Mexico and and before and after on average. So looking at until 92 and then on average afterwards. So it's really kind of this delayed spike in unemployment in Colombia, which is the the big difference. Okay, which is that's fine. Yeah. I was focused on like the impact stuff, but you're going to kind of talk about long run changes, it sounds like. Okay. All right. So let me, let me jump to the model. So the, I'm going to use the baseline framework from, uh, from Joshar Gunnar and Talbot, which combines three main building blocks. There is an industry dynamics, there is a fictional labor market, and there is international trade. I'm going to add a set of labor market institutions that I've discussed, and I'm going to solve for the transitional dynamics. So this is a small open economy, discrete time, two sectors, industrial and services, three agents. There are workers, consumers that are risk neutral, they are homogeneous, they face trade barriers if they want to import goods, they can sort into service and industrial labor market. And there are two types of firms. There are firms in the service sector, they are homogeneous, they work, they operate under perfect competition in the product market and they face a frictionless labor market for services of so labor market. So this means that if they wanna, if they wanna hire one person, they can do that immediately. They don't face any friction, any, any cost, any adjustment cost. Uh, there are at the same time, in firms in the industrial sector, they are heterogeneous. They operate in monopolistic competition. They face idiosyncratic productivity, which is time running. They also face search and matching frictions in the labor market, and uh, they are subject to labor market institutions that I that I just discussed. Now, industrial firms, they produce in different, differentiated variety and they are characterized by two elements, the level of productivity, which is 
parameterized as, a, as an AR1 process and the number of employees. Uh, they produce with a cop data technology that combines materials and, and, uh, and uh, number of and employment with a certain share alt. Uh, whereas firms that are operating in the service sector, they operate, they produce with a linear technology. And for simplicity, I'm assuming also that unemployed workers sustain themselves with a value home production by home producing a service good, but with a different productivity beta, B, sorry, which is lower than one and, and, and reflect the cost, the eventual cost of searching for a job and being eventually unemployed. So industrial product market is very standard in this model, monopolistic competition, internationally segmented, there is demand, there is a domestic demand for domestic variety. There is a domestic demand for foreign variety, which depends on top of prices and uh, uh, home demand shifter also on uh, tariffs and aggregate costs. So drops in tariffs or aggregate costs will actually shift the composition of, uh, of consumption goods towards imported goods, generating import substitution. At the same time, to participate into the foreign market, firms will have to post uh, sorry, we'll have to pay a fixed cost of exporting. Uh, they will face demand from from the from the from the rest of the world, which depends on the on the iceberg cost. So any drop in the iceberg cost will actually increase the revenue premium from exporting and the export share of the output. Labor market is subject to search and matching frictions. This means that firms that are work, that are operating in the industrial sector, they have to post vacancy to attract workers, and workers have to search to become employed. Now, job seekers and vacancy that are open meet through a cost and return matching function, which takes this particular functional form, and it, and it is governed by an elasticity theta that does this, that that is basically governing the rate at which vacancy is going to get filled. There is going to be a probability of filling of filling vacancy and a probability of finding a job, which takes this particular form depending on the matching function. Now, the main, the main, the key elements of the, of the models are the adjustment cost in employment and how wages are, are determined. So there is an asymmetric cost of adjusting employment depending on whether firms are actually expanding or shrinking. If they are expanding, they face a convex adjustment cost, which depends on three parameters, a scalar, a convexity parameter, and lambda one, and a parameter that governs how fast you can fill vacancy depending on your size, lambda two. On the other hand, if they're shrinking, firms face a linear adjustment cost, which depends on the final cost. And this is gonna be a parameter that is gonna be, um, uh, that is gonna be calibrated uh, to, the, to the value observed at the time of liberaliz liberalization and then changed in the counterfactual exercise. Now, what is important from this adjustment cost is that because of the convexity in the, uh, in the, in the adjustment cost for firms that are expanding, uh, firms that are exporting will expand very slowly. Whereas firms, because of linearity of, of, the, of the adjustment cost for firms that are shrinking, firms that face import competition will actually downsize on impact. So this will generate this asymmetry that will make workers reallocate from employment to unemployment and then slowly back to, to, the, to the employment in the, in the industrial sector. The second element that I want to stress is how wages are, are determined. Uh, and wages are bargained between every firm and all in the entire workforce through an intra-firm intra bargaining pro, uh, protocol, which maximizes the joint surplus of the firm and all the other, and, and the pool of other workers. And, uh, and this particular protocol is actually subject to two constraints. One is the participation constraint, one is the minimum wage constraint. Now, the participation constraint is a constraint that firms have to satisfy to make sure that workers won't, uh, won't be willing to leave their firms and go to unemployment and search for a new job. This could be the case every time the surplus of the worker is negative, and this can arise because of, for instance, firing costs. Firing costs by create, could create, uh, could create the for certain firms and, uh, and for, for certain firms with a certain productivity and number of employees could generate negative surplus. Firms with negative surplus would still be operating because of, because of, because of exactly of the final cost. But this, of course, 
will violate the participation constraints. So France will be forced to at least pay the, the outside option for workers. The second constraint is the minimum wage constraint. It's a, it's a regulation constraint. So wages cannot be uh, lower than the, than, the, than the statutory minimum wage, which is lambda, lambda uh, underscore. And of course, only one of these two constraints will be binding, but whether the minimum wage is binding or not, it's critical because it will basically shift the adjustment from, way, from wages to employment. And the model is closed with firm dynamics decision. There is an exit decision that from stake ever period, comparing the value of operating net of the, of, of the operating cost with the outside option, which is zero. And there is an entry decision uh, which makes firm entering until the expected value of entry is equal to the, to the cost of entry. Let me briefly discuss what are the mechanisms in, in this model. So for import, for firms facing import competition, the, the, main, the main mechanism following a trade liberalization will be a reduction in the, mar in the marginal revenue. Now, a reduction in the marginal revenues will make the condition for labor demand uh, not holding anymore. In particular, the marginal gain from, from, uh, from an extra worker, from hiring an extra worker will be lower than the marginal cost. So in order to establish the equality, there are only two ways, either firing workers, making therefore the marginal gain higher, or reducing wages, renegotiating the award wages. But of course, the, the labor market institutions are going are gonna to determine which one of the two margins will dominate. Very large filing costs will actually force firms to renegotiate through wage, to renegotiate wages because they will generate an inaction region in terms of employment. On the other hand, very high minimum wage will force firms to, to adjust to employment simply because they are legally uh, they are legally, they cannot legally lower the wages uh, below a certain below a certain level. At the same time, there is a there is there is also an effect through the labor supply decision because, because of input competition, wages might go down. So the value of working in the tradable sector might go down, making the value of working in the non tradable in the, in the non tradable sector larger, higher. Therefore, in order to establish this, the equality in the labor supply condition, part of the unemployed workers have to be uh, have to be have to flow into the pool of workers. In the uh, employed in the non trainable sector in order to make the job finding, from, in order to make the pool of unemployed lower, therefore the job finding rate higher, re establishing this equality. But this is, not, this is not, of course, the only mechanism in place. There is the other side of the, of the coin, which has to do with firms that are actually expanding. For those firms, the marginal revenues are going high, are going up simply because they can participate in the foreign market or they can, exp they, they can expand the export share of their output. The only, the only way to, to reestablish equality in the labor demand condition is either by hiring new workers, so making the marginal gain uh, from, 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 from an extra worker lower, or by slowly increasing their marginal cost, meaning renegotiating wage output. Now, the wage renegotiation is dictated by the protocol. So it happens every time a shock hits the firm or policies change. Whereas the, whereas the choice of employment is something uh, that the firm does endogenously and, uh, and it's subject to the, to the, to the margin of co to the adjustment cost. Therefore, this won't happen, this won't happen immediately upon, upon the arrival of the trade shock because of the convexity of the adjustment cost, but it will happen slowly. And again, the margin of the export decision will affect the labor supply in the opposite way because the, the presence of firms that are exporting actually makes the value of working in the, of searching for a job in the tradable sector now higher compared to the value of working in the tradable sector. Therefore, to reestablish the equality in the labor supply, now for workers might have to move from the, from the non-tradable sectors to the pool of unemployed workers searching for a job in the tradable sector in order to make the job finding and, and making at the same time the job finding rate lower than before. So there, is, there are different margins operating through the labor supply and through the labor demand, depending on, uh, on, uh, on whether 
the import competition is stronger than the effect of the export uh, participation. And uh, labor market institutions are gonna distort all this margin. So the, the next step will be to calibrate the model and to understand uh, how, they, how these institutions uh, behave. So to calibrate the model, so, I'm gonna take- Alessandro, can, yeah. may I interrupt you again? Of course. The other market that's going to be, also have its frictions and be uh, interacting with the labor market as a capital market. There's a recent paper by Cole Vici and, and the Scoop that argue that uh, because of financial institutions were not well developed in Colombia, the uh, capital can reallocate from the expanding to the from the shrinking to the expanding farms, right? Mm -hmm. And then Mexico at this time that you're looking at, I think it's prior to it's a first liberalization of the WTO, so it's the boom in capital and in investment uh, prior to the tequila crisis. And so, um, you know, that would help with the figures that uh, help explain some of the figures that you were showing to motivate this exercise. So can you talk a little bit about capital and potential differences in capital development between these two countries? This is, I mean, this is definitely interesting, an interesting margin. Unfortunately, I mean, the model doesn't account for that. I mean, it, I'm, all, I'm the production function for industrial firms has uh, material, so broadly speaking, so if you want to understand capital in a very in a very loose way and uh, think about the capital market as frictionless, then it would be included in the model. Another margin you could think of the, uh, think about uh, you could think about capital within the model is in terms of number of firms. So you can think that there might be different changes in the number of firms. Uh, in the domestic, in the in the industrial sector, in the industrial sectors, and in particular firms that are only domestic, non-exporting versus firms that are exporting. So you can think of capital flowing from firms that are very low productive under, uh, towards firms that are very high productive to the extensive margin, meaning new firms created. But there is nothing related to the intensive margin of capital and the accumulation, and nothing related, unfortunately, in this model, nothing related to the to the. To, the, to a friction, to a capital market that has friction. So definitely that could help explaining, introducing another margin could help like the, like the one you're mentioning, could help explaining part of, the, part of the adjustment that we observe also in the labor market. Uh, and it actually could help fill the gap uh, that the model is not able to account for. The model it will be able to account only for a portion of the differences in unemployment rate observed by the two countries, there are many dimensions left out, of course. One dimension is capital, the other dimension might be informality. This is not explicitly modeled as well. Uh, the, but yeah, the model, we, we can only speak up to a certain extent about that. Okay. So jumping to the, to the calibration, there are a few parameters that are taken directly from the data. Uh, they can be measured via uh, interest rate, share of consumption of service goods, export revenue premium. Some parameters are not identified, cannot be identified in the model, particularly the elasticity of consumption, the bargaining power, and the elasticity of matching fraction they are taken from the research. And all the parameters related to the policy, they are all calibrated to the observed value. Tariffs are observed, iceberg cost comes from, uh, from matching the increase in the in the export revenue premium following the liberalization. And this has to do also with the different nature of the liberalization. To some extent, as you will see later, I will calibrate iceberg costs differently to account for changes in the export revenue premium following the liberalization, driven by differences in, in the nature of the trade liberalization implemented with this example. And the regulations we, uh, I observe directly, uh, directly done from the data. Um, oh. Alessandro, just just I'm, yeah. I missed this. Um, so this is a sunk cost model of exporting, or it's just a static exporting decision. What what I I, I missed that. Um, it's a static it's a static exporting decision. So that seems like uh, I mean this I yeah. Do you have some sense on how that's going to affect your results? I mean, obviously um, there's a lot of heterogeneity in who exports and people don't expand into the export market right away. And, and um, 
without a stat, without a dynamic decision, you get very different kind of relationships between um, productivity and and export status. So, do you have some sense as to how that might um, amplify or mitigate some of your results? This is something that I haven't explored. Okay. This is something that I haven't explored, but this is something that definitely I could I could look at. But you will capture like the the slow adjustment in the aggregate level. But when you were saying you were capturing like the you were going to let the trade cost to change gradually, is that is that how you're going to kind of? That's true. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean. All right, so uh, we're left with a number of parameters to calibrate that have to do with costs of operating, exporting, entry, adjustment costs, productivity, elasticity of output, and uh, own production and from ex exogenous portion of from exit rate. Those firms, uh, those, those parameters will, will, cali will be calibrated using the method of simulated moments. And uh, in particular, uh, we construct moments using firm level data for the manufacturing sectors for Colombia and Mexico. Uh, we calibrate separately the model to fit the two, the two countries. I'm gonna use the Enquesta Annual Manufacturera for Colombia, covering the universe of former firms with more than 10 employees for the period before the 92, so I'm gonna choose 81, 90. And for Mexico, I'm gonna use the Enquesta Industrial Annual, so the industrial, uh, annual survey that covers former firms with more than five employees for the period before the first liberalization, which is 84 and And using this firm level data, I will select, um, I, will, I will construct the following moments that have to do with firm levels. That uh, first moment, average log employment revenues, share of exporting, no entrance to export, auto correlation of export participation. There will be moments of uh, employment percentiles, percentile distribution, and other aggregate moments that have to do with turnover, vacancy rate, labor payment share, and exit rate and average and average wage. So among the estimates, I will focus in particular to the adjustment costs. And in particular, what I'm showing you here is the calibrated adjustment costs for Colombia and Mexico. Colombia is in black line, Mexico is in blue line, evaluated for different employer size when they have to hire either a single workers or 1% of the workforce. What is clear from this picture is that if we look at the right and the right and picture is that costs are really convex, but in particular, um, they are much larger for next. The calibrated values implies a much larger hiring cost uh, for the same share of uh, increase in the workforce. And this is mainly due to the fact that the model is trying to fit different, different employment distribution and different firm size distribution. And in particular, it's trying to fit a much, uh, a distribution that is much more skewed to the left for the case of Colombia, for the case of Mexico rather than Colombia. As you can see here, there is the Mexican industrial sector is populated by a larger share of smaller firms that are between one and 49 employees. And at the same time, also on average, those firms are actually smaller compared to Colombia. Indeed, if you look at the log employment percentile, they are all shifted towards the left compared to, compared to Colombia. So Alessandro, just to understand, you potentially could fit the data just as well by having the countries defer in their heterogen in the heterogeneity across farm productivity but you're fitting it through the frictions in the labor market. Is and, uh, there, is also, there is also heterogeneity in firm productivity. We are estimating, I'm estimating a process of the, of, the, of the productivity, but this comes from, this to be identified comes from dynamic moments. So in particular, it comes from uh, to drop to know and exit rate. But the, the only heterogeneity. Way to be the heterogeneity across firms uh, could, I'm just trying to understand how you identify labor market frictions. And the question is from what you said, I understood that you identify those frictions by imposing the same level of heter overall heterogeneity and firm productivity. And is that, um, did I understand it correctly? Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I wasn't clear then, maybe I wasn't clear, so no. I I'm estimating a process of, um, of, of productivity which follows an autoregressive 
process, okay, which gives heterogeneity in productivity across firms within a certain country. And at the same time, I'm trying to capture as well differences in adjust, I mean, the adjustment costs in, in the two countries as well. Now, how do I tell apart the adjustment costs from the differences in productivity? The adjustment costs come, the identification of adjustment costs come from, the, from a static moment, from static moments that has to do with the cross-section of the firm distribution. So probably the firm distribution and the cross-section of the employment distribution. Whereas the productivity, the, pro the parameters that uh, are related to the process of productivity, they come from the dynamics. So they come from, they're identified from moments that are related to job turnover, so volatility of, of uh, so volatility in changes of employment, I mean, job creation and job destruction, and firm exit rate. Sorry, Alessandro. Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. Hi. Um, I must have missed it. What are you doing for the little guys that, that aren't really covered by the NAHE data? How are you getting their uh, turnover rates and uh, the distribution down there? For, for the small for firms, firms, the firms less than 50. Oh, I'm cutting. I'm, I'm cutting the simulated distribution to 50. I'm not. I'm excluding. So I'm simulate. When I solve the model, I simulate the model. I cut the distribution at five, and I only and I replicate basically what I observe in the data as well. I see. So you see, you're not trying to match anything down at the small end of the distribution. No. No. And the same for Colombia, because for Colombia, I observe only firms that are larger than 10 employees. So I'm cutting the simulated distribution of 10 employees. I'm looking constructing moments only for those. That are that are larger than ten employees. Okay, thanks. Okay, so in the last twelve minutes that I've left, let's uh, speak a little bit about the the counterfactual exercise. The first exercise I'll do I'll, I'll do is to implement the observed trade liberalization in both countries under the observed labor market institution. This means that I'm going to compute the steady state equilibrium under the observed policy. I'm going to implement a reduction in tariffs that is exactly equal to the one observed in Colombia and Mexico. I'm going to introduce also a reduction in, in iceberg cost to match the increase in the revenue from exports observed in, the, in both countries. And as I mentioned at the beginning, Colombia opened up the trade also uh, with, um, together with a liberalization in the labor market, reducing the firing cost from 50% to 80% of the early real wage. So I'm going to introduce also that. I'm going to compute the transitional dynamics and I'm going to compare the average outcomes along the transition for both countries with the data. And this is what basically we get. Uh, by construction, I'm matching, I'm, I'm targeting the, I'm, tar I'm calibrating the, the change in average cost to match the export revenue share. So this is exactly equal to the data for both countries. I'm not targeting the share of exporting firms, but the model still can generate a large portion of what we observe in the data. Most importantly, the model accounts for differences, for, for differences in the, in the response of unemployment rate, the share of manufacturing employment, and the job turnover rate in particular. On average, in the 20 years following the liberalization, the model generated an increase of 2.64 percentage points in unemployment rate, whereas in the data, on average, you get a three percentage points. It overstates slightly the increase in unemployment rate in unemployment uh, for Mexico, generating an increase on average of one percentage point. In the data, we observe a much lower value. It also captured differences in the decline in, of the manufacturing share of employment, four percentage points for Colombia, one percentage points for Mexico. It actually overstates that difference. And at the same time, it's able to capture differences in job to number rate to some extent. In particular, it generates more than 30% of the job to number rate observed in Colombia on average and uh, uh, more than 50% of the one in Mexico. Uh, and uh, Finally, speaking about income inequality, the model can account for a portion of the differences between the two countries. It can explain one third of the increase of the income inequality observed in Colombia, and uh, almost everything of the income, almost all the increase of the all the increase in income inequality on the Gini coefficient of income inequality in Mexico. Now, remember that this is a model with homogeneous 
workers. So uh, all the heterogeneity comes from differences in productivity and differences in employment, uh, which translates in differences in wages across, across workers. So despite not having a heterogeneity in workers, still the model can account for, for changes in, in income inequality, in wage inequality and income inequality. Looking at the entire transition, this is what, uh, this is what the model generates. There is an overshooting in unemployment for Colombia that, uh, that goes up to 3.3% 3 percentage points, that, and it reverts back up to almost 2 percentage points, so it moves on one percentage point. Nothing that, that, that doesn't happen in Mexico. In Mexico, there is a large uh, there is a jump directly to the city state, something that seems to be happening also in terms of industrial employment that drops in Colombia and then goes back to four percentage points in the long run, whereas it almost declined in, uh, in Mexico. But of course, these changes in unemployment and industrial employment um, are the result of changes of different changes in job turnover, job reallocation, much larger in Colombia, from exit probability, much larger in Colombia as well, but also differences in what are the margin, in the margin of adjustments that I've mentioned before. In particular, I'd like you to focus on the upper panel, the falling probability spikes in Colombia. It goes back, and this is because most of the most of the dismissal happens on, on impact because of the linearity in adjusting the in the fighting in the in the downward adjustment cost for employment, and then it stays higher along the transition. If you look at the right up panel, I'm reporting the share of firms paying the minimum wage. This this follows a completely different dynamics between the two countries. As you can see, Mexico, firms in Mexico are able to adjust following a liberalization by unable to adjust wages down. So they, there is a big chunk of firms that suddenly start paying a lower wage, making, making the share of firms paying the minimum wage much larger in impact. But then as firms grow, they pay higher wages, so it declines slowly. That doesn't happen in Colombia, where there is already a big, a large share of firms paying the minimum wage in the initial city state, because they are opening up with a very large statutory minimum wage. So this forces the selection, which increases the average wage and makes firms moving away from that, from that, uh, from that corner. Therefore, the share of firms paying the minimum wage actually declines right away. And of course, these margins of adjustment then are reflected into larger productivity of the, um, generated by, by firms in Colombia and larger average size, something that in Mexico actually almost doesn't work. Now, the second exercise I'd like to, 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 to do is to discuss is the following. These differences between the two countries could be driven by the institutions in place, but also could be driven by other by differences in other parameters uh, that, that the model can account for. For instance, we have seen that the calibrated adjustment costs are different between two countries. So they could actually lead to differences in, in the input of consumption. So the question is how much of the difference that we observe in the input of consumption function could be addressed, could be uh, due to the differences in labor market institutions. To account for that portion, for, for, for to answer this question, what they do is to solve the first city state under counterfactual labor market institution, and then implement exactly the same trade, trade liberalization. So the input response function that I will have will be different relative to the initial one, only because the initial level of, of institutions are different. So differences in input response function will actually be, can only be attributed, in the, into, attributed to differences in the initial level of institution. And here I'm reporting a number of examples for Colombia in black and Mexico in blue for the baseline liberalization for the case of Colombia and a liberalization implemented under a lower minimum wage. As you can see, there is a big drop in unemployment rate. The opposite happens for Mexico, where I'm implementing central liberalization over the basement, but or a liberalization, a counterfactual liberalization implemented with a low filing cost. So the differences between the two countries actually shrink with counterfactual institution, making this institution explaining on impact 30% of this difference and in the long run, 60% of this 
Now, this is the, the counterfactual institution actually predicts also different uh, input response for the average firm size, which actually increases the low firing cost for the case of Mexico. It would be lower for lower with lower minimum wage for the case of Colombia. But most importantly, the margin of adjustment that I've discussed, probability of being fired and funds paying the minimum wage will actually change completely. In particular, you see for the case of Colombia, under lower minimum wage, upon impact, upon a trade, upon a trade liberalization, firms will actually adjust wages downwards, making the share of firms paying the minimum wage much larger in the counterfactual world. So this is this. This uh, type of adjustment can actually be uh, be explained by the difference in institution and quantitatively unemployment can be explained up to a certain amount. The differences in unemployment can be explained up to a certain amount by this institution. Uh, in the last minutes, I want to talk briefly about um, welfare and, uh, and the gains from trade. And in, in particular, I want to try to understand what are the implication of these differences this different uh, trade liberalization on the gains from trade and the distribution of those gains uh, among workers. To talk about gains, I'm going to use the implied notion of welfare by the model, which is basically the value function of the workers that are employed in industrial firms that depends on the, that depends, first of all, on the level of consumption of those workers, which is exactly equal to wages plus other transfers. But also depends on the probability of being dismissed that could either be due to firm exit or because of firing. Now, policies that affect the level of consumption, so the average wage, in particular, the policies that will increase the average wage will actually, will actually increase also the gains from trade. But if those policies come with a much larger probability of firm exit, this, this can actually revert back the amount of gains that a certain, policy, a certain trade liberalization, liberalization can generate. And at the same time, if there is a divide between high productivity firms and low productivity firms in terms of higher wages generated by the first one and higher probability of being dismissed in the, in the second one, this actually will increase the dispersion of the wealth of the gains from trade by increasing the correlation between the gains and the state variables that are productivity and, and, uh, and number of employees. And this is exactly what uh, I was discussing. Uh, so I'm reporting, let's focus on one of these graphs, let's say the upper, uh, the upper right graph, uh, upper right scatter. So I'm reporting the average welfare gain percentage increase in the long run against the dispersion in the, in, the, in the welfare gains, again, in the long run, for three types of liberalization for Colombia, the baseline, a liberalization implemented with low firing costs, and a liberalization implemented with low minimum wage. As you can see, there is a trade-off between how much gains are generated on aggregate and how much dispersion these gains, how much dispersed these gains are across workers. And in particular, this trade-off is Created by institutions that um, that are low, that are that do not generate any um, any wage rigidity. In fact, low minimum wage allows firms to renegotiate wage downwards. So this actually reduces selection, reduces dispersion. As we move to institutions that actually have much larger wage rigidities, we are able to force the selection at the expense of a larger dispersion and this happens equally across all the all, all uh, across both countries and also both in the short and in the long run uh, so i think i have exhausted my time if i have one minute more i will just discuss this and then i will conclude this is the last piece of uh, ex last exercise that i perform in the paper which is Try to evaluate the trade reform implementing implemented with a positive transfer to the unemployed, five percent of the average annual wage, financed with a payroll taxes, and uh, I'm evaluating again the change in the average welfare and the change in the standard deviations and the dispersion of wealth for the baseline and for this new counterfactual exercise, both countries. As you can see, there is again a trade-off, a trade-off that 
arise by when we introduce an employment insurance, and in particular, both the short run and the long run increase in welfare are lower, but they come with a much lower dispersion of this welfare across across workers. So large, there is lower, there is there is lower dispersed, uh, there is less dispersed welfare across the workers, but it comes with a larger cost in terms of in terms of lower in terms of lower welfare overall. So uh, let me conclude here. Basically, I tried in this paper to unveil and quantify what are the role of labor market institutions on the response to unemployment following the trade liberalization and try to evaluate welfare implications of those trade reforms and try to show you that there is a trade off between dispersion of wealth, between aggregate welfare and dispersion of welfare that is generated as an economy moves from uh, employment rigidity towards wage rigidity. Thanks a lot for your attention and your time. Great, thanks Alessandro. Um, I'm never good at getting the reaction. Um, Rafael and Cecilia were quicker. Um, do we have any, uh, do we have any, op um, we have time for some more comments if anyone wants to ask some questions, we just sort of open it up to the floor. So I'll ask a question. Um, so Alessandro, um, so everything you looked at was the impact of if we if we lower like import tariffs, but everything must work in reverse if uh, the rest of the world is lowering tariffs on on uh, Mexico and and Colombia. Is there any way of kind of looking at um, the impact of neighbors liberalizations on on these uh, on Mexico and Colombia and and are those going to basically undo the long run differences in, in employment that you're finding? It, it shows up in the in the, um, in this parameter here, which is which is the export revenue premium. If you see, so if we go back to the demand, the foreign demand for domestic variety, this depends on a, an exogenous demand shift and on the export cost that affects also domestic work. So if anything happens, if there is a reduction in, uh, in tariffs from any any from the rest of the world, it would show up basically in in the increase in this parameter here. Yeah. So I mean, I I guess what I'm what I was worried about was um, we've seen like tremendous amounts of integration, and then uh, over the last fifty years, but we don't see unemployment going up in a systematic way globally, um, and so. In, in the Colombia case that you were looking at, it was kind of telling us unemployment is going to kind of go up with integration. So I was trying to think about what was going to kind of undo that since I, you know, my, my prior is that there's really not a long run relationship between unemployment and, uh, and trade integration. So, well, I mean, the model indeed predicts some, uh, some larger, I mean, some overshooting of the unemployment rate, though in the long run, it seems to be higher, consistently higher relative to the, to the previous state, but part of it comes, part of it is temporary. But, but most, it, of it is long, most of it is long run and it's related to the, um, the real wage kind of falling because it's just an import, uh, you're facing more import competition. Whereas when there's a, you know, if, when it becomes better to export, that's gonna pull up the real wage and the, the minimum wage no longer is, a constraint, and so that would seems to you know if, if we think about on average trade costs inwards and outwards are kind of moving together just at different times. It just seems like that's another force that um, might it, be worth looking at. Definitely, there, I mean, in, in the models, there are there are also forces that come from the labor supply. Yep. That indeed part of as you can see here. I mean, if you look at Mexico, there is an increase in unemployment of one percentage point. But there is almost no decline in uh, in uh, in, um, in employment of the industrial sector. So this increase in unemployment actually comes from a decline in the in the in the share of workers that work in the non-tradable market, who are actually moving, who are actually moving and trying to look for a job in the trade in the tradable goods. And this is because actually average wage is high. This is what's happening. This is what's happening here. Now, this is not true in Colombia, or at least not, not all, I mean, not all the increase in unemployment rate comes from the, from the supply side in Colombia. And this is because 
the probability of firing in Colombia is much larger. And uh, as opposite to the case of Mexico, the share of, of employment in the service sector actually shrinks in Colombia. Ah, sorry, actually expands. Sorry, actually expands. So which means that part of the workers that are, that are dismissed from the trade sector actually flows into, into the service sector. So there is also this margin that actually that generates persistent increase in unemployment rate, which has to do with how much the service sector can expand and take care of uh, take care of the of the workers that are dismissed from the manufacturing sector. And, uh, Alessandro, I think George's question seems cl very closely related to what I mentioned at the beginning. So, uh, Colombia was already a member of the WTO. Other countries' tariffs did not change with respect to Colombia when Colombia decided to liberalize. In our mm -hmm. static models, exchange rate depreciates and trade balances, right? But that didn't occur in Colombia in the medium run, in the shorter medium run. It only occurred in 99 um, with the big exchange rate crisis in Asia, Russia, then in Brazil drove their exchange rates down. So um, what exactly are you doing? I was curious as you were going through this, what is happening to import penetration in these counterfactuals? And what is happening to export expansion to that tau, for example, that you say is the model? So if I manage to move just one second, I'll try to okay. Um, so this is what happening, for instance, on revenues of non-exporters and exporters. So as you can see, they for non-exporters, they drop on impact much more in Colombia. For exporters, they increase much more for Colombia, and they keep increasing actually along along the along the transition as firms are actually growing and expanding their size. Uh, but there is a, there is an effect also in terms of, the, of a number of firms. So you see that there is a there is a huge drop in the number of firms in the number of domestic firms in Colombia something that in Mexico does not witness at all. And, uh, and, uh, but the, and the composition of firms also changes dramatically because the share of exporting firms actually doubles. In Colombia, something that Mexico does not, does not, uh, does not witness. That's in the model. This is in the model, yes. This is what the model predicts. So obviously in the data, all these things are gradual, right? Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it, absolutely. It, it, so it might, it might be useful to put in like a, a phased in reform that kind of captures the export expansion and import expansion paths. Um, mm -hmm. But I think Cecilia m m was also kind of talking about like, how is the model closed, right? Like what, what's the general equilibrium of it? Is it, um, you know, there's like a fixed interest rate um, and, with, with, I guess, with risk neutral <laughs> consumers, you, you must have that. And then there must be something about how is borrowing and lending with the rest of the world kind of taking place? Is that, is there no borrowing and lending? Because those seem to be no. fe features that were key in, in uh, the transition periods. Um, exactly. Well, the model, the model of struck from borrowing and lending, there is a uh, trade balance, which gotcha. the value of import equal to the end, the value of export. Gotcha. Okay. And, 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 you may, as a robustness check, at least uh, match aggregate imports and exports, because then that will show up, even okay. if it's just, just exogenous, the dust is going to be exogenous. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I have some robustness check in terms of um, anticipation of the trade reform. So I implemented basically not, uh, the same type of reforms, but announced it five years earlier. And this gives me a gradual increase in most of the in most of the outcomes that uh, that that uh, that the model can generate because of firms already foresee the change in a few years on of the of uh, in, in the in the in the product market the product market. But this is true that I mean the same type of exercise could be implemented with a with a gradual increase in, uh, in tariffs, uh, gradual decline in tariffs, a gradual decline in iceberg costs to match to match a number of other aggregate outcomes. 
Another question I have, which is also related to robustness checks, is you talked about wage downward wage rigidity only when you hit the minimum wage. Have you checked what happens if you impose downward wage rigidity overall, right? Within firms, firms don't want to um, bring their wages down is in the market of literature. Oh, okay. This is interesting. I, I mean, I haven't checked, but definitely would amplify the action of unemployment. Uh, yeah, definitely. That, that would definitely happen because the only margin of adjustment would be actually employment. I mean, the employment firms would have to be forced to, to reduce employment without being able to renegotiate wages downward. This would actually generate a much larger uh, spikes in unemployment rates in Colombia. This is, yeah, you know, so you want to adjust for the, <laughs> the inflation, right, and make it nominal wage rigidity. Mm -hmm. That would be more literal in the, yeah. uh, with respect to the macro literature. Sounds hard to do, then. Is this you? Well, maybe I'll suggest something that's probably not quite as hard to do, which is um, Empirically, I mean, there must be some industries where the minimum wage is, you know, way below the the average wage, and and uh, so we should see some heterogeneous response across these industries in terms of the response the uh, the response to the trade reform. Moreover, you know, we know this reform was quite heterogeneous across sectors, um, right? And so you might be able to sort of use that heterogeneity to kind of test the model a little bit more. Um, and in in terms of you know what it what it predicts for changes in the wage distribution and the kind of firm size distribution. Um, hmm. So, yeah, something that I can show you right here is in fact the distribution implied by the model for wages and the distribution of firm size changes. So in, yep. on the left on the left one you have basically the distribution. You see that this is before the trade liberalization. And you can see that there's a much larger share of firms paying the minimum wage before the liberalization in Colombia. Uh, exactly because the minimum wage in Colombia was higher. And this has, been, this has been discussed quite extensively in the literature. There are many papers talking exactly about the fact that in Mexico, Mexico adjustment could happen because of larger because of less strict downward wage rigidity compared to compared to Colombia, and uh, and at the same time, I mean, Colombia before the liberalization, before the trade liberalization, had also larger fine costs, which increases the the inaction region, making firms less willing to adjust employment, and this shows up also in the distribution of firm size changes before the liberalization. So. So in your model, for workers are identical, right? Um, and all of this is kind of like some guys got lucky and some guys got unlucky. So are, are you saying that like uh, the same worker, there's a doubling of their income, whether they were lucky or unlucky? Is, is that, um, is that, I don't know if that's, um, last week we saw a paper by Huneas who was trying to look at like the sources of wage inequality. And I was just, that seems like really a big, big gap. Um, is oh, that, I mean I, I do agree that, so we know, we know that wage inequality, that let's say two thirds of wage inequality on a, usually two thirds of wage inequality can, can be explained by differences in workers rather than differences in firm. If we run a standard Abel, yeah. Kramer, Margoli, you know, type of regression, say AKM, AKM regressions, we know that usually one third is addressed by by, is explained by firms, two thirds is explained by workers. And I mean, indeed the model cannot explain the entire wage, the entire wage inequality. If we look at moments of wages, which, which are here, uh, you can see that, I mean, actually the model does even much larger, I mean, much better than expected can explain up to a certain extent of the entire standard deviation of low wages. Uh, across firms and across workers. I mean, that's that's a definitely a relevant margin. I mean, but it's. I mean, it would it would make. I mean, it would create very huge complication in this model with large firms having heterogeneity. It would expand the, the state oh, sure. space and yep. 
Alessandro, I mean, it's interesting that you try to, to match the, the aggregate uh, dispersion. I mean, in, in Brazil, I mean, the model fails miserably in, in that dimension. I mean, for Mexico here, it's also pretty far. What we try to do instead is, is not to match this because you have a lot of idiosyncratic uh, uh, sources of wage dispersion, right? You have ability differences and so on and so forth, which the model doesn't speak to at all. So we actually just try to match how wages are systematically related to, to firm size. And, and in, in that regard, I mean, the model matches uh, that, that moment uh, pretty well. I mean, this, is, this, this might be something you might want to, to think about because, I mean, if you just show, right, a, a, a model fit of, of that sort, I mean, it can put off uh, referees that might be thinking about, you know, I mean, if you cannot match that moment, why, why, why would you impose it? But the, the thing is that, yeah. Dispersion, I'm not targeting dispersion. Oh, you're not, okay. Those are non-targeted okay. moments. I'm not trying, I'm not even trying. I mean, I know, I mean, I know that hey. if you don't have a worker heterogeneity, I mean, sure. it's, 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 it's very hard to, and actually, even with worker heterogeneity, you might need to also job to job transition and many model of search to, to, uh, sure. to match okay, the current okay. distribution. But it's true that the model also generates a positive size wage relationship, even though the type of bargaining usually predict lower wages for larger firms in the cross section that seems to be that seems to be a positive size wage relationship as well it's not as big as in the data and this is exactly this is entirely due to the type of bargaining protocol that we are using that predicts lower wages for firms that are very large and uh but still it can generate actually for mexico that's actually quite quite good Got it. So, so the other thing I would say is that uh, at some point, uh, George asked you asked you about you know uh, expert dynamics, and uh, I mean it's it's true that in this model expert decisions are static, but you're still going to see a lot of dynamics in the expert uh, front in response to shocks because it takes a while for firms to to grow right because they have these convex uh, hiring costs. So I think this is a uh, this is also one one uh, one thing you could have said. Uh, in, in, in response to George, I guess. Yeah, it, 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 it doesn't get you much though, right? Um, you really need some, some uh, something that kind of slows down the, the trade dynamics. Um, I, I agree like the, you know, the distributions are um, what they are, but if you, if you look at like the export intensity dynamics, those jump right away, right? Uh, Cause that's just a matter of like what the trade cost is between the foreign market and the domestic market. Um, but 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 have you shown this, Alessandro? The behavior of experts over time. Have you shown this? Yes, I I have it here. Exporter firms, for instance. Well, it's it's hardwired into the but, model. But, but what about exports are just but, but, a constant fraction of, of revenue yeah. you're exporting? So it's, you're not going to get anything interesting out of that. Oh, but here, but here it's interesting, right? So I, I mean. Here is just, I mean, the, the, the figure that you highlighted, that's just the extensive margin. I think the interesting margin is, is actually the, the, the figure above, the revenue. right? Because then even for existing exporters, I mean, it takes a while for these guys to actually eventually grow in response to, to the shock. I mean, I, I, I could show you the picture of uh, export dyna exporter dynamics in, in Colombia. It's just, they don't sort of all jump in and then their export intensity doesn't all jump up. It's, that's how it is in every country when you have liberalization. You get a little bit of an intensive margin from the, the direct tariff change. And then these guys have to, um, for exporters, they have to sort of grow out their export capacity, which is kind of building just foreign distribution networks. Um, but I, I think there's an easy fix for that. If, um, but I think, I, I guess the, the one of the things I was I wanted to come back to um, was if you got rid of all the search frictions, how, how different would everything be? Like, I know you wouldn't be able to talk about wage wage distributions, but you know, if we think of like just Hoppenheim, Hoppenheim Rogerson, right? That model has firing costs, hiring costs, or whatever you want, and it also has like a E over L, right? Um, and so you can you can get movements in in unemployment and or the employment ratio and you, out of those models well, from like you, a liberalization. You, you can get movements in employment. You cannot speak about unemployment because there won't be any unemployment. No, but you know, in, in the end, uh, 
it's kind of the same thing, right? It's whether you work or you don't work. There's here you've got like risk neutral agents. They don't really care that they're being unemployed. Um, I mean, we're getting uh, I mean, back to the we're getting back to a discussion we had. But but the thing here is, uh, I mean, if you have a labor supply decision, employment is going to systematically increase once aggregate conditions get better, right? Yeah. Whereas in this kind of model, if you have a shock, it can be positive or negative. You're going to have an you're going to have reshuffling of uh, you're going to have reallocation and, and and it can have also you know uh welfare implications i guess if you think about labor supply versus unemployment yeah in george's world there, there would be one wage rate yeah no so I, I i get it you can't really talk about like the wage distribution stuff um but you can kind of do most everything else and i was just curious you know, how different the results would be. Um, and, you know, if, if there was kind of features of the search model that were, you know, how much is the search model kind of magnifying things? And then, um, you know, like in, in, in a lot of search models, like there's really not interesting transition dynamics because people search pretty quickly, right? Um, and so, I mean, most, I mean, yeah, most of what happens is, you know, if, if you kind of just, that job. yeah. You need something that's going to kind of slow that down, but that can also be in any kind of adjustment cost, right? Um, if you had something where like whenever I kind of get rid of a worker, he's got to spend a little bit of time like before he goes into the next job, just mechanically, um, you could kind of get the same thing. So I guess I was just trying to figure out like how different would the results be if you shut down that one margin, which obviously that's an important, an important feature, but you've kind of, you've kind of shut down like why we think it's important is because like unemployment shocks are not really insured. These guys, in this model, people don't care about unemployment shocks because they're risk neutral. That, that's true, but there is that distribution of consequences of reform. Now, of course, if you, if you take literally what is welfare in the model, well, even if you take literally what is welfare in the model, I mean, if you increase probability of being fired and of being unemployed for longer time, that has an effect on welfare overall. I mean, the, the no, no, I mean, you know, there's, there's differences in income between these, these guys. Um, exactly, exactly. Of um, course, there is, no, there, is no, there is no risk in the sense of, in the sense of Ayagari type of risk. Yeah. Workers are not, yeah, I mean, workers are not risk averse. Uh, but you can always think about, I mean, I always like to think about in this type of framework, like a, about the social planner that cares both about average gains and distributions of those gains. Even though workers are this neutral, you might think of some inequality of version of the social class for reasons that are outside of the model. And if, if this were the case, then a planner would actually, in this in this space, would like to move on the on the on the bottom right of the figure, increase the gains at a lower dispersion, depending on how inequality of versus. Okay. Any anybody else? Well, I'm gonna go. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Bye, bye guys. Thank you. Thank you guys. Take care, Rafael. Thank you. Thank you.